smartphone hacking on an industrial scale. Prince Harry's battle against the Daily Mirror reaches the courts. The Duke of Sussex has the paper's then editor, Piers Morgan, in his sights. He's always denied any involvement in illegal activity. Today, he hit back. I'm not going to take lectures on privacy invasion from Prince Harry, somebody who spent the last three years ruthlessly and cynically invading the royal family's privacy. Prince Harry says illegal activity by the Mirror ruined his relationship with Chelsea Davy. We'll assess what Harry's intensely personal court action could mean for the Prince and the press. Also in News at 10 tonight. From coronating the King to criticising his government, the Archbishop of Canterbury speaks out on behalf of migrants. The bill could lead to the collapse of the international system that protects refugees. Is that what we want? Fatal protests spread across Pakistan as Imran Khan is told he'll be held in custody with other members of his party now being arrested. Working full-time but homeless, a worrying rise in the number of people who can't afford to even rent a flat in the UK. Plus... The sound that scientists hope could help us better understand the Northern Lights. This is ITV News at 10 with Raggy Omar. Good evening. Prince Harry's latest privacy court action began today by hearing claims of unlawful activities on an industrial scale at Mirror Group newspapers. But outside the confines of the court, he himself came under a blistering attack over issues of privacy. The Duke of Sussex is one of a group of high-profile figures launching claims over allegations of illegal information gathering, such as phone hacking. The newspaper publisher is contesting the cases. At the start of what's expected to be a seven-week trial, it was alleged a flood of illegality was being authorised and approved by senior Mirror Group figures. But speaking to us, the broadcaster and former Daily Mirror editor Piers Morgan accused Prince Harry himself of cynically invading the royal family's privacy. From coronation to court, Prince Harry's not back in the UK, but is at the heart of a trial that began this morning, a crucial part of his crusade against British tabloids and editors who, it's claimed, left morality at the door. The High Court heard today that there were... Today's target, former Mirror editor Piers Morgan, who gave ITV News his defiant response. Are you willing to apologise? Apologise? I think, I think Prince Harry should be apologising for his disgraceful invasion of privacy of the royal family. And others, by the way. Mirror Group Newspapers, the publisher of the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People, is accused of unlawful information gathering on an industrial scale for 20 years. Voicemail interception, obtaining people's private information by deception or blagging, and the use of private investigators for unlawful activities. The court was reminded of these images of 12-year-old Prince Harry at his mother's funeral. It's claimed for more than 15 years he was subjected to the most intrusive methods to obtain his private information, leading to huge bouts of depression and paranoia. He says nowhere was off-limits and even blames Mirror Group newspapers for his breakup with Chelsea Davy. The illegal intrusion, he says, made her decide a royal life was not for her. The flood of illegality at Mirror Group newspapers was widespread and habitual, it's claimed. Members of the board and the legal department allegedly knew about it and tried to conceal it. It's claimed former editor Piers Morgan authorised the systemic use of private investigators to unlawfully obtain people's private information and that he knew about phone hacking, something he's always denied, even under oath at the Leveson inquiry. Have you listened to recordings of what you knew to be illegally obtained voicemail messages? I do not believe so, no. Well, you either did or you didn't. I don't think it's a question of, of belief. 
I do not believe so. You continue to trash her. OK, I'm done with this. No, no, no. His very public spat with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex led to his departure from ITV. Now a new conflict is being played out in the courts. I'm not going to take lectures on privacy invasion from Prince Harry, somebody who spent the last three years ruthlessly and cynically invading the royal family's privacy for vast commercial gain and told a pack of lies about them. So I suggest he gets out of court and apologises to his family for the disgraceful invasion of privacy that he's been perpetrating. Prince Harry has always said he won't settle. He wants accountability and he wants his day in court. He'll get that next month when he comes here to give evidence in person. A royal witness at the Royal Courts of Justice promises to be explosive. Coronation Street actors Michael Turner and Nikki Sanderson, allegedly first targeted when she was just 15, are also among the claimants in this trial due to last seven weeks. Rebecca, um, this is a big deal, to put it mildly, for Mirror Group newspapers. What have they got to say? Well, in the court papers, Mirror Group newspapers do admit one instance of unlawful information gathering against the Duke of Sussex, and they unreservedly apologise for that. But lawyers argue that there's no evidence of any phone hacking in any of these claims and say that some of the claims have been brought too late. This trial is potentially damaging for Piers Morgan, one of the UK's best-known journalists, especially if he's found to have lied under oath. But I think it's also potentially catastrophic financially mm. for Mirror Group newspapers, yeah. who have already spent more than £100 million settling claims. If they lose this trial, it could open the floodgates for yeah. many more claims. They're accused of blatantly unlawful and illegal behaviour against a member of the royal family as he was grieving his late mother. It was described in court as quite frankly appalling but perhaps worse senior executives are accused of uh, concealing that of deliberately lying to yeah. members of the public the Leveson inquiry and their own shareholders one final point for all those who are slightly confused about the various different cases being brought by Prince Harry at the moment there are three separate cases against three separate newspaper groups this is the first one of those to reach the trial stage and there'll be more and more to come Rebecca, thank you very much indeed. Now, it may have been pointed out already, but it bears repeating. The person who on Saturday placed the crown on King Charles's head today launched an astonishing attack on one of the flagship policies of his government. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, was speaking in the House of Lords debate on the government's illegal immigration bill, the so-called small boats bill. He said proposals were morally unacceptable and politically impractical and could damage the UK's international standing. The government insisted the bill is necessary and is also compassionate. A barge to house 500 asylum seekers has arrived in the UK and protesters gathered in Cornwall tonight to greet it. This barge it, it seems a bit of a prison barge and it's not a welcoming thing. I'm very much against the government's illegal migration bill. Um, it's not an um, awake thing. There are many, many people in public life, like the Archbishop of Canterbury. Just four days ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury was crowning the king. Today, Justin Welby took aim at the government's illegal migration bill. Jesus calls us to welcome the stranger. That call has been part of the history and culture in this country for centuries and was part of the drive for the Modern Slavery Act. I urge the government to reconsider much of the bill, which fails to live up to our history, our moral responsibility and our, politically, our political and international interests. The government's illegal migration bill will mean anyone arriving into the country illegally will be unable to claim asylum in the UK. The Home Secretary would also have a duty to remove the person as soon as reasonably practicable, either to Rwanda or a safe third country. Has it been at all difficult for you to speak out about this legislation? Uh, I don't find it easy to speak out about the government. By and large, I want them to do their job well, and that's, that's what we're trying to say, is that this isn't doing the job well. One former Tory Prime Minister was in the House of Lords to listen to the bishops, but other Conservative MPs are unimpressed.
I think at times the leaders of these organisations aren't always the most in touch with the people that they are. Politicians get accused of this. He's become too political, you think? Yes, I think so. I don't think it's the place for it. And of course, there's that moral and spiritual leadership which I think people look for and I think has maybe digressed a little bit and has maybe crossed a bit of a political line here. Tonight, one minister rejected the Archbishop's criticism. I disagree with the Archbishop in this, in this regard. Since 2015, we've welcomed half a million people into the UK on humanitarian grounds. That's more than any period since at least the Second World War. 6,000 people have crossed the English Channel so far this year. The Prime Minister is convinced his bill will stop the boats, no matter what the church might say. Harry Horton, News at 10. And Robert joins us now from his West London uh, studio ahead of his programme straight after the news. Uh, Robert, what do you make of the Archbishop's intervention? Uh, well, I think it is very embarrassing for the government. Uh, you know, we saw Prime Minister, other ministers at Westminster, uh, you know, they basically saw the... Uh, gave, as the whole nation did, the authority to the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown the king. And now when he says that their bill is immoral, their illegal migration bill, they say that he's straightforwardly wrong. I just interviewed, I think you've just seen in Harry's piece. I just interviewed Robert Jenner. He'll be on my show, uh, that full interview, in just half an hour or so. Uh, and he said he rejected the Archbishop's uh, attack because, quotes, he didn't think the Archbishop had an alternative plan. Well, it's not for the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury to come up with a plan for migration. It is his job uh, to say whether he thinks something is morally proper or not, and he doesn't think it is. Interesting. Now, I also had Chris Gidmore, former Tory minister, still a Tory MP on the programme, he agrees with the uh, Archbishop and says Churchill would be turning in his grave uh, at the legislation that's being pushed through. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, but also there's criticism tonight from the government's own backbenchers after it was confirmed that all EU law won't be replaced by the end of the year, as had been promised. What do you make of that? So there are about four, you know, almost 5,000 bits of EU legislation. The, gov the government promised to uh, scrap all of it by the end of this year. And we have learned today that maybe half will be gone by the end of this year in different forms. Uh, Brexit MPs, uh, and there aren't that many of them, uh, left any more in terms of the sort of uber Brexiters, but they're jumping up and down. They are trying to criticise the Prime Minister uh, over it. But again, Again, Chris Gidmore, uh, uh, on my programme I mentioned earlier, another Tory MP said it was always inconceivable all this legislation could go. Uh, and, you know, it's just simply the government uh, sort of basically facing up to reality. Um, some Tory MPs will say this is one of the reasons why the Tories did so badly in the local elections. I have to say... I don't believe the length of Britain people even really know which bits of EU law happen... Sorry, bits of British law happen to have come from the EU. Thank you, Robert. Look forward to your programme straight after the news. Now, the judgment of a New York court against Donald Trump may have marked a new low in his chequered career, but the key question that's always asked about Donald Trump still remains tonight. Will it actually damage his chances of regaining the White House next year. And there are plenty of people who would say no, despite the fact that a woman writer said she was overwhelmed with joy after a civil trial found Trump had sexually abused her in 1996, although rejecting her claim that she had been raped. He is the first US president to be found liable for sexual assault. She had kept the secret for nearly 30 years. Yesterday was probably the happiest day of my life. Touring the TV studios this morning with her lawyer, E. Jean Carroll was feeling vindicated. This uh, verdict um, is for all women. That, this is not really about me. It's for every single woman. Arguing that Donald Trump has belatedly been held to account. It was this five foot three, wily female attorney and this elderly 79-year-old advice columnists who are finally holding Donald Trump liable. When that, when the jury said yes, we looked at each other and that was the moment. It was such a wonderful, overwhelming moment. The jury verdict yesterday not only awarded Carol nearly five million dollars, but also gives Trump's political opponents hope that his attempt to win back the presidency can be derailed. Trump himself was contemptuous about his accuser, 
and the jury's judgment. I don't even know who this woman is. I have no idea who she is, where she came from. This is another scam. It's a political witch hunt. And somehow we're going to have to fight this stuff. We cannot let our country go into this abyss. It's morning again in America. At the same time, the Trump presidential campaign has been quick to distract and deflect with a new TV ad. Why would we ever accept the incompetence and weakness of Biden when we could have the freedom, security, and economic prosperity we enjoyed just three years ago? It is certainly encouraging for Trump's campaign that even now few Republicans are deserting him. Only his old internal foes breaking cover today. I hope the, uh, the jury of the American people uh, reach the same conclusion about Donald Trump. He just is not suited to be president of the United States. She's a liar and she's a sick person, in my opinion, really sick. It remains an open question whether the jury verdict and his erratic video deposition in the case will fatally damage Trump's presidential bid. In just a few hours, he appears on this stage in New Hampshire to be questioned by voters. Even Trump accepts it's a risk, given yesterday's verdict. Could be a total disaster for all, including me. Let's see what happens tonight at 8 o'clock. His core supporters will stick by him until the very end. But to win the presidency again, he will need to convince some centrist and independent women voters. And that may now prove his greatest challenge. Robert Moore, News at 10, Washington. Staying in America, and the Republican congressman George Santos pleaded not guilty today to 13 charges against him, including fraud and money laundering. The representative for New York has faced strong criticism since he took office in January, including claims that much of his biography had been fabricated. Outside court today, Mr. Santos maintained his innocence and branded the case against him as a witch hunt. If convic convicted of the most serious charges, he could face up to 20 years in prison. Pakistan's deadly political turmoil worsened tonight following yesterday's arrest of the former Prime Minister Imran Khan on corruption charges. At least six people are dead and hundreds of arrests have been made in widespread disturbances involving furious supporters of Mr Khan, who today denied all accusations against him. The violence erupted when the former Pakistan cricket captain, now a popular opposition leader, was dragged out of one courtroom and bundled into a police vehicle to face a different set of charges. On Karachi streets, anger over Imran Khan's arrest boils over. Police clashed with protesters as the former Prime Minister appeared before a judge on corruption charges. As tensions rise across Pakistan, hundreds have been arrested. Khan's supporters were met with zero tolerance. Imran Khan should be released, this woman says. We are peaceful, but the police arrest women, fire tear gas and bullets. Dozens of paramilitary police arrested Khan yesterday. Conviction would disqualify the former cricketer from election later this year. Today, the popular opposition leader appeared before a judge inside the police headquarters where he's held. He pleaded not guilty to corruption, as the judge ruled he could be detained for eight days. This is state abduction, his lawyer says. It's proof there's no constitution in this country. But Pakistan's government rejects that. As a sportsman, he ought to be championing sportsman spirit, tolerance and respecting rule of law. Corruption or corrupt Tonight, Pakistan's Prime Minister gave a televised address, warning protesters some were carrying out acts of terrorism and would suffer exemplary punishment. This arrest has escalated the battle between Imran Khan and Pakistan's powerful military. Tonight, as protests continue, the coming days could determine who wins. Neil Connery, News at 10. 
And intensifying violence tonight in another of the world's flashpoints, the Gaza Strip, with hundreds of rockets being fired from the Palestinian side after Israel continued its airstrikes. The attacks by Israeli forces have killed 21 Palestinians, including three figures described as senior militants and at least 10 civilians. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned this round is not over. Now, a special report now on how the blight of homelessness is rising at an alarming rate, even among people who have jobs. New figures out today show one in four of the households in England that became homeless last year included at least one person in work. Homelessness is something that affected or at least threatened almost 73,000 households where someone had a full or part-time job. By the end of 2022, homelessness among full-time workers had increased by 22% compared to the same period two years ago. London had the highest number of people suffering in-work homelessness, closely followed by the southeast of England and northwest England. The people whom Daniel spoke for his report told us they feel trapped. How, how does it feel to do this every single day? It's absolutely draining and exhausting and tedious. Nicole Williams wakes up every day not knowing where she will sleep at the end of it. I literally search the internet to see what I can find for the day that I need it for. Perched on a single bed in a tiny hotel room, she tries to find another for tonight, all before her working day begins. It's, it's quite embarrassing at the same time, like having to literally figure out what your life is gonna entail for the day. Nicole works full-time as a personal assistant in West London. Four weeks ago, her landlord took back the property she was renting, but she assumed she'd find somewhere else. Got um, my belongings. Who knows where the destination is for this evening. But private rents have rocketed. Competition for homes is fierce. We just got back from work. And the local council say they've no properties for her. So Nicole's moved from bed and breakfast to hotel to friend's sofas, homeless, with nowhere to go. The fact that I'm working and I'm earning a living, that's just, it, that's just crazy to me that, you know, I've got the funds there. I just want to live like a normal person, like a normal adult, go about my normal adult life. Nicole says she's contacted 15 private landlords, but has been outbid or ignored. It's now time for work, and the search will have to wait until later. Four years. In Colchester. So there's you, your husband, and two kids. Yes, two children, yeah. Lisa and her family are having to live in this modified caravan. They moved here temporarily when their private rented flat became too expensive. They went to the council, who said there's a four-year wait on three-bedroom properties. Just show you my son's room. But they've now been here over three years. Their 10-year-old son sleeps in this tiny room in a bed made for a toddler. Definitely no room for a single bed. So that's actually... But they just can't secure anywhere affordable, despite Lisa working part-time and her husband Lee working full-time. They've got no central heating here. It's been cold in the winter, um, no wash facilities. Yeah, we've been told we have to go, we have no choice, we've got to look for private renting, but then we can't go private renting because we're not earning enough. We're not sitting at home waiting for it to come to us. We're, we're going out and working for it and we're still struggling. The government told us it's giving councils £1 billion over the next three years to prevent homelessness and local authorities have a duty to provide families with temporary accommodation when needed. Campaigners, though, say they need to do much more. The first measure they need to do is to uh, upgrade housing benefits so that it's uh, in line with what rents are actually are for people, so that people can pay. That's a really short-term measure, but it's really vital. They need to protect people from eviction so they're not permanently being turfed out just because the landlord wants to raise the rent. Hey, Nicole, Hi. how are you doing? Back in West London. How was work? All right. Nicole really. is checking in to yet another hotel. How much longer do you think you can do this for, so mentally and financially? couple of months either way. Oh, Something's got to give. Yeah. In work, but soon out in the cold, the victim of a crisis, not of her making. Daniel Hewitt, News at 10.
Well, the political future of the leader of Plaid Cymru is said to be in doubt tonight after a damning report into the party's culture. The review found a culture of harassment, bullying and misogyny within the Welsh Nationalist Party, saying women had been especially let down. Party leader Adam Price has apologised and said all 82 recommendations in the report to detoxify the party would be taken on board. Now, the former Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen appeared in public as the first ever reclaimed party MP today and immediately resisted calls for a by-election. Mr Bridgen's defection to the party founded by the actor Lawrence Fox came just two weeks after he was expelled from the Conservatives for comparing the COVID vaccination programme to the Holocaust. Shehab joins me now. Shehab, uh, reclaim have uh, never had... Uh, a, a, a member of parliament without going to a general election. What do you make of all this? Yeah, it's a situation where, as you say, there's a political party that's never stood in a general election that now has an MP. But under our political system, this is completely legitimate. Andrew Bridgen is within his right to change parties if he so pleases. In this case, he's been expelled from the Conservatives. Reclaim are a new political party. They are, as they say, they're fighting woke orthodoxy. They're here to defend freedom of speech. They were set up by the actor Lawrence Fox. The two were together today in Westminster when the news was announced side by side at a press conference that they held. And this will give the party a new platform. It's an MP. They'll be able to vote on legislation. They'll be able to put questions through to ministers. They'll be in the House of Commons. It is a new platform for them. But as you say, Raggy, it is only weeks ago that Andrew Bridgen was expelled from the Conservative Party. He had been very critical of the vaccine rollout. He'd endorsed a number of conspiracy theories. He had said, he had quoted a, uh, someone who had said to him that the vaccine rollout was the biggest crime against humanity since the Holocaust. Now, the Former Health Secretary Matt Hancock described that as anti-Semitic. That is something that Andrew Bridgen said he will take the former Health Secretary to court over. As you say, he said that there's not going to be a by-election, so it'll be some time before his constituents will have their chance to get a say on this. OK, Shihab, thanks very much indeed. Two of the heroines of the Lionesses' Wembley Triumph in the European Championships were honoured today. Beth Mead and Lucy Bronze received their MBEs at Windsor Castle from Prince William, who knows them well from his work as president of the Football Association. Lucy Bronze says she hopes to recover from injury in time for this summer's World Cup. But Beth Mead faces a tougher road back to fitness. Finally, when William Shakespeare wrote of the music of the spheres, the magical sounds of the cosmos were something for the poet's imaginations only. Now, scientists have found a way of converting plasma waves in from space into an eerily beautiful orchestra of sounds. Sounds which, it's hoped, will provide vital information about the behaviour of phenomena like solar weather. Scorching and swirling in space, the sun is bursting with chaotic energy. Solar flares that seemingly silently charge towards Earth, causing one of nature's greatest spectacles, which only some are lucky enough to see. But now, for the first time, we can hear what the northern lights could sound like. What you're hearing here is essentially a giant magnetic musical instrument that occurs out in space. It gets plucked by the solar wind that comes out from the sun and it causes these sort of reverberations, vibrations within our own um, magnetic shield. And what you're hearing is a satellite measuring that that we have turned into audible sound. What would be hard to understand is that space has a sound? There's no sound in space. Oh, but there is. That is just wrong. Um, people say there's no sound in space because they think space is a vacuum, that it's absolutely empty, but it's actually pervaded with lots of particles. They're just very, very spaced out. Sound is actually possible. It's just not audible. Until now. And NASA hopes by sharing this sound across the world, the combined ears of this planet's population might hear a pattern that could unlock the mysteries that still surround the Northern Lights. Seen recently across the country because of the sun cycle, something experts have always known was coming, but there's still a lot they want to learn about what causes the aurora borealis. We still don't fully understand the processes that take place on the very small scales in the Earth's magnetosphere that lead to their formation. The human eye and the human ear is able to pick up patterns 
that computers still aren't able to, to recognize. And hopefully this new concept, listening to the sounds of the Northern Lights, is one way that we might start to unlock its mysteries. It's a sound alien to anyone on Earth, but now it's time to eavesdrop on the magnetosphere and hear the music behind the dance. Sangi Talal, News at 10. And that is it for tonight from me and the rest of the team. Good night. Thank you.